and Google moderator. No, we won't? Okay. No, no internet, uh, so we will not be keeping track of it in Google moderator. We will be doing it with pencils and pens. Jeff, what would you like to say? Yeah, hi. Um, the first thing to note is, is that the current situation is completely unanticipated by this entire industry. Um, we actually knew back in about 1991 that the growth of computers coupled with the desire to connect them meant that exhaustion of the IPv4 trace was inevitable. There was just no getting around that. And that was, as I said, many, many years ago. As technologists, we worked on a solution that took about the next five to six years. And what came out of an exhaustive effort was a protocol designed to address precisely that problem, IP version six. And the theory and we were all good technologists, so we were fun on theory. The theory was that the world would see the looming shortage of V4 and the world would adopt V6 due to enlightened self-interest. It would just happen because no one wanted to see the end. And long before we ever got to the last V4 address, we'd never need it. It just wouldn't matter. There was no last V4 address. We would have all transitioned to V6. As you are probably aware, that is not what's playing out out there. Um, we are now running short on V4 addresses, and depending on where you are in the world, we may have already run out. Um, the central pool, IANA, uh, gave out its last address blocks. These are blocks of 16.7 million addresses. Uh, the last set of blocks left the registry in February of 2011. Um, relatively soon after that, in mid-April 2011, the Asia-Pacific Network uh, Registry, where I work, gave out its last address blocks under the prevailing policy. We then moved on to a different policy, what they call the last slash eight policy. Uh, in late September of this year, servicing Europe and the Middle East, the RIPE Network uh, Coordination Centre, the RIPE NCC, is also down to the end of its prevailing policy and is now into its own last slash eight policy. There are, of course, three regional registries left with addresses, them namely being Aran in the North America and uh, parts of the Caribbean, LACNIC in South America and the Caribbean, and, of course, APRINIC. Um, estimates of this are difficult, but we'd certainly sort of at this point see the run rate happening, uh, that those registries will run out variously uh, in late 2013, 2014, 2015. Um, what's interesting is, at the same time, the uptake of IPv6 is not stellar. It's not as if V6 is an alternative everywhere in the world. In fact, you probably need to hunt very, very carefully to find it. But what you will find, the more you look around, are the use of synthetic addresses and carrier grade NATs. Most of the time, if you're using any kind of mobile device, if you look hard and find the address it's using, it's not a public address. Increasingly, larger and larger parts of the world are behind these translators. And what's going on is that the industry is continuously recycling V4 as a technology and getting more inventive. But at the same time, with this large thirst for V4, there are no more stocks in certain parts of the world. It's hard to get. Um, up until now, the prevailing allocation policy of the regional internet registries was to give you what you wanted. And it actually suppressed pricing because the notional cost of getting what you wanted was relatively small. It was basically a registry service cost. So the whole idea that addresses had intrinsic value and that were marketable resources was never really contemplated because basically the registries were dumping on the market. There was no market because you could always just go and get some if you needed some. And if you didn't need some, why would you bother? They were in abundance. As anyone who's ever lived through uh, various forms of scarcity, strikes by the petrol companies, strikes by super markets and so on, what you actually find is once a good becomes scarce, it becomes valuable because more people want it than have it. And that the folk who need it and need it most will be prepared to bid the highest price. And this very much is where we are in certain parts of the world with V4. Because if you want more than a small amount of addresses, and at the moment, under the last slash eight policy, you can get 1,000 addresses and that's it. No more, forever. If your need is more than that, you're rolling out a new mobile product, 
you've discovered the iPhone 6 is really what you, your customers always wanted. If you need V4 addresses and you happen to be in the Asia Pacific area or even if you happen to be in the Europe and the Middle East and you haven't got them, your only recourse now is to look at the people around you and find out if you can do a deal. And invariably that will probably involve the exchange of money. So we're moving from an environment where addresses were abundant. Addresses were needed, but the need was always satisfied, to an environment where addresses are scarce in some parts of the world, where addresses intrinsically have a scarcity value imposed upon them, and the introduction of a new form of after, uh, after distribution, which is basically the presence of buyers and sellers, the presence of a market. So in some ways this presents a, a whole bunch of policy challenges in fact, it presents the challenges up and down the industry, because as you probably think about it, if addresses are incredibly valuable, should you represent it on your balance sheet? Should transactions attract tax? Should there be import duties and export duties? What about value-added tax? All of a sudden, you're putting a value on something that never had a value previously, and all these considerations enter the arena as addresses uh, effectively attain a scarcity value. And the next thing to bear in mind as we look at this is that this is not meant to be the end game. The network continues to grow. Last year, 600 million new devices got connected one way or another. Next year, it's going to be more and more. Apple hasn't stopped building stuff. Neither has Samsung or HTC or anyone else. We know as technologists, the only way out is V6. At some point, this transitional market can't cope. There is an end inside. But how do you make the transition into market-based distribution as smooth as possible? And secondly, how do you make the transition out a few years later as smooth as possible? Both are important considerations which I hope we'll explore this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, great job of uh, setting the stage as usual. And uh, what I'm going to do is provide a bit of quantitative information about the, the nature of the address space that we're talking about uh, and, of course, when you talk about supply, demand, and scarcity, uh, I, of course, approach this issue from an economics standpoint. So in that respect, addresses have, uh, in some sense, almost always been scarce in the sense that uh, everybody wants more of them and they can't have them uh, without paying a price. Uh, so scarcity doesn't mean there aren't any more. It doesn't mean that uh, nobody can ever do anything with them. It simply means that... Uh, as things become more scarce, as quantity shrinks in relation to demand, uh, the price goes up. So what are we dealing with? How many numbers are we talking about here? Of course, the design of IPv4 set the size as being 2 to the 32nd power, which we round up to 4.3 billion. Uh, there were some parts of the design that set aside certain numbers, that which eliminates about 600 million numbers. <coughs> So you can say that the total usable or routable numbers are about 3.7 billion. How many are available today? The regional internet registries have over 228 million numbers left in their inventory to lease to their members. Afrinic has 70 million. Lacnic has about 60 million. Aaron, about 47 million. APNIC about 18 million, a ripe NCC about 17 million, and the IANA has just received another 17 million back from uh, a return slash eight. Now, a lot of addresses, and this is one of the reasons we're having this conversation today, is in the early days of the internet, uh, the addresses were given out to people, address number blocks were given out and not used really. So prior to the creation of the RIR system, uh, almost two billion numbers were given out by U.S. government contractors. An estimated 876 million of these are unused in the public Internet today, and an estimated 353 million of these are only used in the public Internet in order to show that they're being used and keep others from using them. Uh, that's the basic quantitative parameters of the problem. And um, now we want to go into our discussion. Now, I have to remind you, because of the uh, hostile nature of this uh, venue, 
Um, if you're going to speak, and this whole workshop is based around uh, deliberation and discussion, hopefully constructive and civil, uh, you will need to have a microphone. Nobody will be able to hear you. And if you don't have earphones on, you won't be able to hear what people are saying into the microphone unless perhaps you're sitting right next to them. And even then, you might not be able to hear them. So uh, we will be interested in um, really uh, fostering discussion here. And uh, we're going to structure the discussion by using our framework. If anybody does not have a copy of the framework, I have one spare one up here. Many of you have also downloaded it from the internet. And we've divided it up into issues. And one of the first issues that uh, seems to be controversial and important has to do with the role of needs assessments in making transfers. Now, the, the whole uh, RIR system, uh, their allocation of addresses has been based on assessing need in a technical sense. I'm not. Uh, familiar with the details of how need assessments work, but you file a lot of uh, information about uh, the kind of uses you're going to be making of them, and the uh, RIR decides, uh, based on that information, how much you need, and they give it to you. Now, when we talk about a market for addresses, um, the, we are not simply, at this stage, talking about people buying and selling address blocks uh, as they please. Under current RIR policies, um, you have to, if you want to be a buyer of addresses, you have to prove that you have a need for the addresses you want to buy. And just by way of background, the uh, amount, <clears throat> you know, the concept of need is relative to a time period. In other words, you have to show that you need them now, or you have to show that you need them for the next three months, or you have to show that you need them for the next uh, two years. And the needs assessment time horizon for the so-called free pool address blocks uh, has now shrunk to three months. And for transfers, it is uh, in the Aaron region, two years. What is it in AP, Nick? Um, yeah, thanks, Milton. A, a few things. The RIRs actually don't determine what addresses you get. You ask and you justify, and the RIRs are basically auditing what you've asked for. So in the normal policy sense, it's not that you say, please, RIR, I need addresses, tell me how much. It's actually, I would like to have a whatever block, and the RIRs assess from the material you provide, size of network, market, etc. Um, in the area of demonstrated need for transfers, um, it, the situation is slightly more complicated than this. Um, one of the first RIRs to actually push through a transfer policy was APNIC, and, and initially APNIC had no uh, restrictions on the parties undertaking the transfer with the one proviso that they were both known to the registry. They were basically both members of the organisation so that the RIR itself could understand who the parties were. Um, Aaron uh, and that community um, came up with this idea that they were very worried about, as it points out in your uh, sheet here, hoarding and speculation. And I suppose from the home of the Hunt brothers and their strikes on the silver market many years ago, maybe they have a point, I don't know. Um, but the Aaron community was so concerned about this that un un unconstrained trading would lead to hoarding and artificial price speculation. They put that in and furthermore said that when we think about transfers between registries, we are not prepared to let addresses go to a registry that doesn't have comparable policies. Um, the APNIC community then considered this um, and considered the location of a lot of the legacy address base and decided after some angst and some soul searching that they would impose a similar uh, a set needs assessment policy on transfers in response to that American position. Um, currently, um, as you were right, with Aaron it's 24 months so that if you can demonstrate your marketing projections over the next 24 months that will roughly assess from Aaron's term what you're effectively able to buy on a market. Uh, in APNIC, um, when we actually implemented this policy, Aaron had a 12-month window, so we implemented a 12-month window and we haven't changed things in APNIC. So there's certainly a amount of toing and froing going on there at this point, but that's roughly the position. Good, excellent uh, clarification there. Um, 
So essentially the issue we're confronting now is, uh, as you indicated, uh, some people have maintained that needs assessments uh, were not necessary at all, and others have maintained that they uh, are needed uh, to prevent hoarding and speculation of addresses, uh, hoarding and speculation pr presumably being something that would uh, undermine the uh, efficiency of the Internet as a whole. So that's, I think, where we'd like to begin. Um, there are uh, uh, arguments both ways, and we're not here to uh, particularly push one or the other, but we do want to hear from people here who uh, have a position on that, and uh, could they make that position, please? Uh, this is Peter Timish with ADREX. Um, we can make the case that we have talked to all our people that are interested in selling, and they are the speculators and they are the hoarders. They have told us numerous times that until they get a what they think is a fair value, they're going to hold on to them, and they have been holding on for 20, 25 years. So I would say that there is quite a few hoarders and speculators. They're just the ones that were originally allocated, and they're holding on to what they get. They think they should be paid. What does that say? Uh, what is your position with respect to whether we should maintain needs assessments or not in the current uh, situation? Yeah, I, I think needs assessment is a really great idea if you want to offer it for registry transfers of leased blocks. Keep it, that's fine. But for ones that are not under contract, I don't think it applies. The uh, hoarders, as you would call them, would be the original allocations, and I bet there's some in this room. I bet there's quite a few people in this room that received what's called legacy number blocks. They've been hoarding it for 20 years, and they haven't paid anything for it. And if they want to sell it, I don't see there's any needs assessment required for them. If policies want to be built for number blocks that are held under lease contract, I believe that those are fair. Uh, <clears throat> we just did a study uh, of the <clears throat> market as it currently exists for uh, IPv4 blocks, and we discovered that um, in the Aaron region, where you actually have free addresses available from the RIR, uh, that people are still buying addresses. Indeed, uh, most of the current market for IP addresses is in the Aaron region. And the conclusion we draw uh, was whatever you think of needs assessment as a policy, that the market is basically bypassing needs assessment. Uh, it's going for the longer two-year term instead of the shorter three-month term, and that's why you have a, a flourishing market in Aaron as, as opposed to people taking advantage of the so-called leased or or uh, free pool addresses uh, available from uh, the registry. What this would indicate was that maybe uh, the existence of needs assessment is, um, is in some sense a bottleneck on the actual transfer and the efficient transfer of resources. Um, Milton, I think the concerns um, coming out of the community in in Aaron that actually looked at this issue are uh, valid concerns. I think if you look at any market, be it real estate, the stock market, cars, or IP addresses, there is a problem when folk behave badly, where the transaction is deliberately fraudulent, where the prices are artificially distorted, where the concept of open pricing no longer exists, and that both buyer and seller become victims because of asymmetric information. Many markets have these risks, and most countries have regulatory regimes in order to effectively address those possibilities, whether it's the Security Exchange Commission in the United States, the Australian Securities uh, uh, Corporation in Australia, and similar. That doesn't mean that the Titles Office is the enforcer of the regulatory constraint. And indeed, the Titles Office for real estate is simply the Registrar of Title. So the real question is not whether hoarding speculation and other forms of behaviour are good or bad or indifferent. They're the bad behaviour. And that distorting a market devalues the good that's meant to be traded on that market. There's no question about that. The real question is, what's the most appropriate agency to effect, or at least enforce, norms of market behaviour? And here's where you get into the situation of who's the right party to do that. Now, as I said, traditionally in many markets, there have been regulatory bodies whose job it is to do precisely that. And in Aaron, 
they were searching for a similar mechanism and came up with registry policies. I think what you're saying is you're doubting whether that's the right way of doing it. And I must admit, I can certainly understand some valid concerns because once you start putting barriers to entry to a registry, the alternative is you create another registry. And the one thing that we really can't stand in terms of the integrity of the network is to have ambiguity about addresses. And if you ever get into a situation of competing registries, the byproduct is almost naturally um, competing allegations or uh, attestations about the provenance of an address. And at that point, all's lost. Because if an address is ambiguous, the network just fails. So part of this issue is, should we make the registry the gateway of a whole bunch of policies about market behavior, or should we search for other agencies, even at a national level, who have historically been uh, the enforcer of certain forms of norms of market behavior? And you know that, I think, is at the heart of a lot of that particular debate. That's an excellent point, and I, I just want to make it clear that when we talk about um, bad behavior in, in markets, uh, whether it's hoarding speculation or outright fraud or anything else, um, murdering people, stealing things, um, that is obviously you need rules for that, but the point is when you buy a house, there's nobody that says, do you need this house, right? They, they don't say to me, Milton, you've got uh, one kid, uh, a, a wife, and a dog, and you've got a five-bedroom house. Uh, couldn't you really make do with a four-bedroom house? Uh, all they care about is whether I can pay for the house and uh, you know whether I actually make good on the payment. They don't ask me whether I need five rooms, four rooms, or three rooms. So some of the discussion about address needs assessments pertains to that, and that's an important discussion. Now, you've ri raised really what is a excellent, uh, I put it down as A3 on our policy list here, which is uh, search for another party to enforce these things. Because you might say, yes, hoarding and cornering the market could be a problem. We recognize that. It's not like we're oblivious to that. But maybe it's national antitrust authorities or maybe it's somebody else who might be uh, the appropriate person to worry about that. Thank you. I'm Bill Smith with PayPal. Um, I don't do IP address allocation or anything like that. And first thing I'd like to say is I, I think we should leave to the experts uh, a bunch of this policy making and decisions around it because they've been doing it for um, quite a while. Second thing, that Milton, to your point about um, you, know, you don't get asked uh, when buying a house in the US, uh, can't you do with a smaller house? Th that's true, um, but that may not be true elsewhere, number one. And the second thing in, in the United States, at least in certain places, if you are building a house because of uh, wa water issues, availability of water issues, when you go to build, you will be asked to justify the size of the property, and how much water you're going to consume, and whether or not, in fact, you will be allowed to build in certain places. So there, there are examples of uh, you know, markets that are just financially driven, and then there are others where there is a resource, in this case my example is water, that may be scarce, and it has to be uh, put rationed out, and there is a needs assessment that is performed of some, some form or another. So I, I think they're both, both are viable. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's uh, Bill pointed out uh, more or less what I wanted to say, but uh, I, I will put more uh, extremist examples. Um, I think that the, the the way in which this issue is being uh, approached is uh, is uh, from a, is mainly from a U.S. Per perspective. 
and you are assuming that uh, the rules, the, the, the kind of markets that are um, that we can see in the United States are common around the world in every country and the customs and rules are exactly the same. And the, the, the world is, is much more diverse and the interests are different, rules are different, laws are different. So you cannot treat that just as, as a, any other good being uh, bought and sold in the uh, in United States. As for example, in, in many countries you cannot uh, buy a land if you don't need, if you don't uh, demonstrate the need of the land for producing or even your nationality. Uh, there are rules in many countries that, um, and I'm not say, I'm saying democratic and open countries that are, are have uh, rules, that, for example, that you cannot, uh, if you are a foreign uh, citizen, you cannot uh, buy a land, a uh, big land in uh, uh, close to the borders or even if, you, if it is not for producing some kind of things. But <coughs> there are many other examples. Uh, you cannot go to a hospital and just saying, okay, I want to buy a, a, a surgery in my, for my heart. Uh, so somebody has to approve that. Somebody has to, to say that you, uh, you really need that. And uh, more if, uh, if there is any kind of, uh, of, of subsidies uh, from, the, from the public. So this, there is many different examples. So you cannot just choose an, uh, one example that is buying a house as, a, as something that is uh, close related to the, to the uh, um, addresses management system. I think that this is very different, and as there are many other different markets. Anybody else want to intervene here? Okay. Let me say, to, to respond to Bill's point, um, uh, when you're talking about infrastructure demands of a uh, property, um, you're talking about what uh, economists call an externality, and uh, there's, um, it's not clear to me that you could make a, a very strong case economically or legally that uh, the owner of an address block affects the the uh, the number of this is going in and out that from from the standpoint of the way the internet works it doesn't matter whether Bill Smith owns a slash 16 or whether I own it uh, there may be behavioral conduct things that are you know I may be a spammer and a bad guy <clears throat> but needs assessment doesn't catch that so let's be very focused on what we're talking about here we're talking about whether somebody decides whether you can't buy something because in their economic assessment, which is bound to be unscientific, it can be technically precise only according to certain criteria that, such a, that are based on time and, and projections in other ways. And they, we, we know because they've changed dramatically in the last 10 years. Uh, they've gotten tighter and tighter because we've gotten uh, less and less of a free pool. So what we call need is not an objective thing, it's a, it's a subjective thing. And the question, the fundamental question is, you know, if somebody wants to buy a block of numbers uh, and can pay for it, uh, who are the RIRs to tell them they can't have it? Uh, now, admittedly, there could be hoarding or cornering the market issues. Uh, that's an antitrust issue. Again, the question is, that, that uh, Jeff raised is, is the RIR the best entity to enforce those kinds of problems? And finally, I just want to say that this has really nothing to do with talking about markets as they function in the U.S. or, or anywhere else. I think it's just, it was an example because I'm from the U.S. I used an example of my house. It has, you know, uh, nobody asked Imelda Marcos whether she needed more shoes, okay? There's an example from another country. Um, we... Uh, you know, lots of markets function uh, without a gatekeeper that says we're going to do a, a, an analysis of whether you really need this. And there are lots of markets that do function with those. Typically, they have been extremely prone to authoritarian abuse because somebody is sitting there saying, you can't just get this resource because you want to buy it and you can pay for it. You kind of have to convince me that you really need it. I think we can all see the, the potential there for some kind of a, a problem. Milton, um, with all due respect, I think there's another perspective on this. Um, don't forget that the internet is actually a child of progressive deregulation of the telecommunication sector. That the entire concept of a privately funded, rather than public funded, telecommunications activity that spanned the globe was unthinkable in the 1950s. 
fact, you'd probably say it was unthinkable in the 1970s. But this is effectively a deregulated activity. And when you talk about it effectively deregulated activity, you then raise the question, how does the industry then impose constraint upon itself? Because obviously when you have many players who all need to coordinate on basic essentials, there is a requirement at some point to create limits on individual behaviours because you actually want a working cohesive whole at the end. So the standard sort of phrase then is industry self-regulatory practices, where the industry itself creates a code of practice. And you see it in advertising on television these days, you see it in a whole bunch of activities which previously used to be regulated by administrators, becomes regulated by the industry itself and its representative saying, here is our code of behaviour. You could see the regional internet registries is actually being a product of industry self-regulatory practice. And it's not that the RIRs stand outside the industry, they are that industry trying to create a codified set of behaviours that the industry as a whole are willing to work towards. So from that perspective, if you wish to cast the Aaron uh, position around needs-based assessment of, of transfers as being an industry self-regulatory measure that's effectively trying to self-impose upon itself a set of limits on behaviour. And certainly I can understand their motive and rationale from that perspective. Personally, I think there are different ways of solving the problem they were trying to solve, but that's my own view. But, you know, I could certainly crace more credence on it than I think you were doing. I think they did have a legitimate ground for doing what they did based on, as I said, industry self-regulatory practice. I think um, that's not, it's not a really a problem for me to, to accept that. Uh, indeed, uh, a study I did of IPv6, uh, we were talking about how would you do the initial allocations of v6, and there's really no reasonable alternative to somebody saying, I, I need something according to some very general criteria, and you give it to them, right? You, don't, you can't have a market because the space is too big, uh, and you, you know, I have no inherent, uh, I'm trying to get a, a discussion going of the criteria of n needs assessments. And one of the things I think we haven't dealt with enough is the, the impact w when you actually have a flourishing market and you give uh, people who are legacy holders, that is they are outside of the RIR system, outside of the self-regulatory system, you give them an incentive to bypass that system. You say, if you go this way, you don't have to do needs assessment. And you can uh, that probably increases the value of your asset. Then uh, you you may have a problem, even if you believe in needs assessments. Okay, so let's just get a, a sense of uh, uh, a straw poll here. I mean, we're not voting in the sense that whoever has a majority wins. We just want to see how much uh, agreement or disagreement there is here. So we've got three policy alternatives. One of them is that needs assessments are inefficient and arbitrary and basically should be done away with. Two is that needs assessments are needed and basically supports the status quo. And the third is that needs assessments may be necessary, but we should search for another party to, to do them or to do the things that needs assessments are supposed to do, which is prevent hoarding. Do you want to propose another one, Arthur? Thank you. I thought I heard a fourth, which was, and, and that had been in, in your statement, that needs assessments are okay tool for those that are doing leasing to use, but they aren't necessarily a tool for all purposes. So there may be cases where they are efficient and usable, but not necessarily. To clarify that, my remark was, yes, if you receive number blocks under a needs assessment, then you should be continuation of policy I see as rational and, and probably makes good sense. If you do have number blocks that are yours, I don't see the extra growth of that policy expanding to people who are not under that regime. So it, you, I think almost your point is it goes back to A3. Is there, should there be a separate entity or regime that would do this and let the registers going back to being accurate registries? 
Yes, what, Actually, what, I think, what I was uh, trying to say was a, a separate body that looks at market behaviour. So you, it's not about needs assessment. It's actually about the issue of hoarding, speculation, fraud, murder, and all other kinds of bad things. We, we concur 100% with that. <laughs> so, uh, Peter, what I would say in response to you is that the issue you're really talking about that Avery thinks you're talking about is under B, the status of legacy holders. So we'll save it for that. We have another intervene. Yeah, Paul Dixie, uh, Aaron Board of Trustees. I, uh, I see that you've introduced the the word lease and you're talking about leasing addresses that is not what the RIRs think that we are doing or what we call what we are doing so I want to uh, more or less object to that terminology but separately um, the idea that uh, needs based assessment serves only the goal of preventing hoarding and speculation is uh, new in this room at this time uh, what you'll see in the internet uh, RFCs that created the RAR system is that it was meant to, the, the needs based assessment was meant to promote efficient utilization. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, remote participants who have questions. Uh, there are, uh, uh, this is the time to do it before we uh, do our little straw poll. So let's go ahead with the remote participation questions right now. by the AR uh, I in why is that uh, the requirement for needs assessment predates AR in and this document for number resource blocks issues before AR in's inception in IETF uh, RPS 2050 can you please comment and uh, there is question from Alexei Ivanov he said that why we need needs assessment. If buyer uh, ready to pay for IPS, then he need IP addresses. And there is one comment from Sandra uh, Brown, uh, which says that sorry, uh, that needs assessment by an RIR is arbitrary. It doesn't allow for varying business models. Few businesses operate on a one two year time strategy plan limit on the volume you can buy is not the answer and our RIR policies are an impediment to business right now it would be great pleasure to uh, hear the uh, answer thank you I think uh, first of all on um, on John Curran's comments uh, basically he's telling us about the history of needs assessments he may be correct about that but it's not really germane to whether we need to keep them or not so I'm going to not respond to that on the other two I'm, I'm taking those as expressions uh, both Alexei uh, I, I missed his last name Alexei something and Sandra Brown I'm taking that as expressions of support for the a1 position that we don't need needs assessment at all so I'm going to move forward now to the straw poll. If you think uh, needs assessments are inefficient and arbitrary or otherwise we do not need them, please raise your hand. You don't want to be raising your hand, Raul. Hey, what? what? I don't see the, do you hear? Yeah, I don't see the reason of this straw poll. Uh, in fact, I don't think that this is a good practice in, in IGF. Sorry, it's our workshop. That's what we're doing. Don't vote if you don't want to vote. Uh, Milton? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I find the, um, this issue in particular, uh, this is Bill Smith, by the way, um, and the alternatives rather arbitrary, and we didn't discuss them. The additional ones, A3, is not on the, the document I have. I don't know what I'm voting for. So I, I would ask that we, if we're doing a straw poll. 
Okay. Yes. This this went out. Okay. If we're doing a straw poll, we need to know what we are voting on, uh, or casting our um, uh, our interest level of interest in, and I can't determine that. The only one that seems clear to me at this point is uh, is a one. Okay, look, we have to kind of um, uh, sort of. Uh, try to cooperate with the experiment here in uh, the process that we've set up. And uh, if you feel like you don't know an option or understand an option well enough to have an opinion on it, then uh, don't participate in the straw poll. No, we're not. We've we're, we're got to move forward. We have five other topics, okay? I'm sorry if uh, you don't like the process of having a straw poll. I'm very sorry about that, but uh, we're going to have a straw poll. <laughs> The options are right in front of you. And in terms of the A3, uh, Bill, can you show some respect for the, the process here where we're trying to actually have a, a workshop in which people deliberate in a calm and, and rational manner? Bill, you've, you've, uh, you've had several opportunities to speak. We have five other topics to go through. and uh, so you can, you can address my issue simply by stating what the options are. That's all I am asking. I will, again, tell you what the options are, which I already did uh, five minutes ago. A1 is needs assessments are inefficient and arbitrary. We've had several people expressing that view. A2 or that they are needed to prevent hoarding and speculation. We've had uh, quite a bit of people expressing that view. And also Paul Vixie saying that they're needed uh, for other reasons, for efficient allocation. So that basically needs assessments are needed. A3 was that we should uh, search for another party to enforce the policy objectives of needs assessment. Can I add a fourth this time, a clear one? And that is none of the above because sorry, but I look at these and perhaps I can't explain what my fourth other than none of the above would be, but my opinion doesn't fit any of the above. Sure, uh, anybody sh could be free to propose an alternative, although again, let's respect the time limits of this workshop and try to get on, so I don't want an endless proliferation of, of these things. People online are wondering whether they'll be included in the poll as well. So um, once we have the final list, can we put it for them so that we they can vote as well? Yes. Okay. By the final list, do you mean, uh, Bernard, the list of options? Okay. So, so the fourth one to add now is none of the above. So I, I have another option, and that is actually on all of these to request that there be a, a, a category of no vote, an abstention. You can abstain. Everybody can abstain. But most people probably will abstain. Sorry, Mr. Chair. I, uh, first point is that uh, I didn't know that I was part of an experiment. I think uh, I just thought that I was coming to a workshop but um, for having an open dialogue. But uh, can you explain uh, how the, the, the conclusion of this uh, poll will be used? Because uh, I don't think that uh, nobody can uh, take a, a conclusion about uh, a, a voting of a group of 50 people uh, that uh, is participating voluntarily in this, uh, in this meeting. So I don't know how it will be reported tomorrow in the critical internet resource session or if it, if it can be used in a different way. And, um, and as, uh, as a principle of uh, as I, how I see the, the, the IGF uh, working methods, I think that uh, voting in a workshop is a very bad practice. Just uh, to uh, record my, my opinion. All right, uh, there's got not going to be any more discussion of this item. We're going to move on and uh, we have now Bernard, uh, do the um, people online understand the four options now, or the five options, including abstain?
All right, this, this is really uh, a lot simpler than some people are making it out. Uh, we're getting a sense of the room. Is that understood? We just want to know whether we all agree on this. It's pretty clear that we don't, uh, but uh, let's find out where people stand. We will record that. Uh, we are required by the IGF to do a report on that, and uh, that's what we're going to do. So let's start with option one. Who believes that needs assessments are not needed at all? They are inefficient and arbitrary. Raise your hand, please, and keep it up. So we have three Who believes A2 needs assessments are needed to prevent hoarding and speculation or for other reasons? We have four hands. A3, we should search for another party to implement the um, objectives of needs assessments. And notice that I'm voting for this one, too. You can vote for more than one, as long as you're not self-contradictory. So one, two, three, four. Is your hand up, YJ? Yes, it is. Uh, Brendan, is your hand up, or are you just holding the microphone? OK, one, two, three, four, five, six. None of the above. We got one. Abstentions. Abstentions. Raul, are you abstaining? No, Mr. Chair, uh, this is Bill Smith from PayPal. I'm leaving this session now. Okay. I'm grateful that it's uh, it will be uh, mo noted that I am leaving. Great. And I object the fact to the fact that you are changing the voting mechanism in the midst of the vote. Thank you. I thought we were changing the voting mechanism because you had suggested several new options, but. Um, Oh, my goodness. Okay, it's a walkout. So there were no abstentions. Is that right? No, no. Bill Graham, you were abstaining, right? Bill, you were abstaining? There was one abstention. Uh, Milton, I think it's pretty clear that either way you look at it, there's no clear agreement from the folk in this room, which doesn't surprise me. Um, the regional internet registry communities had discussed this topic for at least the last five years in almost every single one of their meetings, and it absorbed thousands upon thousands of emails, literally hours of debate, and encompassed a, a massive range of perspectives. The industry has a hard time dealing with this problem. There are no clean, clear-cut answers here, Milton, and you've just explored the fact that, yes, it took us five years to come to the same extremely difficult proposition that grappling with this is extraordinarily hard and that answers aren't easily obtained. So, yes, as far as I can see in A, there's no clear consensus in this workshop. There's no clear consensus in the industry at large about what to do, and we've yet to try and figure out what we're all comfortable with. That's an excellent uh, summary of the situation. We have um, uh, Bernard reporting in with the results from uh, remote yes. participants. Yes. So uh, I have Isaac Cameron, Samsung Yosef Esayas, Alexei Ivanov, John Curran, Sandra Brown, Louis Terchi, Hwasun Zhu, Olga Fomina, and Irina Kopiriulina. I hope none of them is in this room. Okay. So uh, the results of the poll. <laughs> is uh, 6 for A1, 2 for A2, 0 for A3, and 1, yes, 6 A1, 2 A2, 0 A3, and 1 A4, as well as 1 abstention, um, no answer. Thank you. You can inform the remote participants that their votes made the three top assessments almost exactly equal, indicating again that uh, Jeff is right. There is no uh, 
no agreement on this, and uh, I really have trouble understanding why <clears throat> uh, it is so difficult for people to uh, simply go through that exercise and document that. Uh, obviously, we could talk about this one issue the rest of the time, but we're not going to. We're going to move on to the status of legacy holders. This one should be easy. Um, I've always actually thought predominantly that a lot of this problem is actually sitting inside the United States. The initial seeds of the DARPA work of the internet involved a number of folk, very, very early adopters, who in participating in that particular project many, many years ago were given addresses to do so. At the time it was the old class A, class B, class C, and if you had more than a couple of computers, you probably had a class A. That's what happened with early adopters. We never intended that network, that exercise to be this internet. At the time we kept on saying it was an experiment. We were going to do something else for the big time. But as you're probably aware, evolution is one of those things that a whole bunch of very, very small changes each day at the end of 10 years produces a massively different outcome than what you'd expected. So yes, there are a bunch of folk out there, predominantly in the United States, but they exist elsewhere as well, who actually have got address blocks from pretty much the old DARPA project and the contractors to DARPA. And there is a large issue within Aaron around this about what particular policy structure and framework accommodates those interests. I actually think personally that this is an issue which Aaron is dealing with and Aaron should deal with and Aaron is coping with this and that I'm kind of uncomfortable commenting on a problem that really isn't inside my particular domain. Um, maybe others have different opinion but you know quite frankly I think this is one area where the whole history and, and the whole background of this sits largely inside the United States and Aaron and this is very much a case of there is a clear community to discuss this and a clear bunch of interests and that happen to coincide in the one organisation. There are very few major international issues that come out from that other than this issue inside Aaron. Jeff, this is Peter again. I just want to offer, um, we did some research on the ERX program that APNIC got about 1,472 networks who were transferred for about 90 million numbers and RIPE had about 4,632 networks for just under 200 million numbers. So we are still talking about sizable blocks, but you're right, they pale in comparison to the 1.5 billion numbers that Aaron had predating their existence. So you're absolutely right, this is a predominantly North American issue, but what's happening is, is the people that are holders of the legacy blocks want to transfer them to the regions of RIPE and APNIC because you're the only two that you cannot meet the demand. So it is a transnational issue. It does go across regions. And I'm curious to hear how you look at receive, you obviously you, you, you implied that there was some reason for you to update the needs assessment policy. Was it in, in a moment of clarity it seems because the ma majority of the legacy numbers are in Aaron region and therefore you felt it was necessary to comply with Aaron's wishes so you could get access to those number blocks? Well, it wasn't me personally. Um, the policy proposal that was put forward at the time um, and the rationale that was put to the community that, that, that uh, looked after that uh, was based on, on the position that the um, Aaron community took with their policy that they would not transfer across to an RIR who didn't have a similar needs assessment based policy. Uh, there was some concern that that would affect the ability of folk inside the Asia Pacific to um, gain access to those addresses and as a very pragmatic move they said fine we'll just put in a needs based assessment. To some extent it was kind of overrated to the extent that if you want to buy addresses you probably have a need and that in the Asia Pacific area the whole needs based assessment wasn't treated with as much drama as it was in other areas so it was I suppose probably quite a, a pragmatic Asian move to say well if that's what they want well that's what we'll give them but I'm not sure it was much more than that. Well let me just intervene here to uh, outline the policy alternatives um, that I've uh, put into the framework. Um, 
So B1 is uh, absent a registration services agreement, uh, which would include a legacy registration services agreement. The legacy blocks are not subject to RIR policies. And uh, B2 is that legacy blocks should be subject to RIR policies. Now, in some sense, uh, the, the stakes of this kind of a question are such that this will ultimately be settled by litigation. But uh, what we're after here is a sense of the community. Uh, do you believe that uh, legacy blocks should not be subject to RIR policies if they don't have a contract with the RSA? Or do you uh, uh, believe that uh, the RIR should somehow try to assert some kind of policy authority over the transfer of legacy blocks uh, whether or not they have uh, such a uh, contract with the legacy holder. Uh, so I'm, I'm not trying to get into the legal issue here. I'm trying to get into the normative or policy issue. But the RSA is an Aaron construct. None of the other RIRs even have such a, a concept. This is not... Or, or the local of, equivalent. Th there know. is no local equivalent. Oh, sure there is. There's a, no. There's a, you don't have a contract with your block holders? We have a contract with our block holders. The legacy RSA is a different construct. It's what Aaron actually used to come to terms with folk who basically predated Aaron and everything else, and there was a sizable number. We actually don't have a comparable agreement. We have a simple agreement. In APNIC's case, it's a membership agreement. So the question would be that if I'm a legacy holder in North America who wishes to sell to an Australian company that is a member or not a member, I mean, they would like it to appear in the APNIC registry. Are, can they maintain and own that, or do they need to come to you to approve it? Are you, are you stating that your simple agreement doesn't require them to get approval for that transfer? Our preferred option. Our preferred option is that within the area of responsibility of where the address is coming from, which appears to be Aaron, that the disposer has come to terms with that registry entry and that as it leaves Aaron, the Aaron registry reflects that departure and that the acquirer is a member of APNIC. As it enters APNIC, the registry reflects the movement of addresses. I'm deliberately phrasing this as a registry-based issue. Addresses only make sense if they're unique. But I can stand here and shout that the number 13 is mine and you all know I'm lying because it's just a number. What actually makes that number unique, Jeff's number 13, is that there's a registry somewhere that everyone else agrees to look at to find out who has what address. So that uniqueness is not a simple assertion, it's common acceptance. So the issue is the registry itself is the paramount thing here. So that we have now five of them. And if a block needs to move from one registry to another, then yes, the policies reflect the fact that the registry that held the entry has got to do a job with an eraser. And the registry that's acquiring that entry needs to write in a new number. That way, the industry itself now knows who's got that address now. And that's the real aim of the registry function. So yes, the answer is phrased in terms of, I'd really, really like to phrase this in terms of how do we maintain the the integrity of the address plant via the registries. We may not be uh, totally grasping the significance of this issue. If, as uh, Peter points out, there are one and a half billion legacy numbers out there and these numbers can be traded uh, without uh, the participation or approval of the RIRs, um, then the nature of the entire address uh, allocation system is transformed. Uh, it becomes market-driven. The, the registries, the RIRs, become pure registries and less policy development and enforcement mechanisms. Um, that's meant to be a neutral statement, neither for or against either option, but I think it's pretty profound, and I just wonder if we're appreciating that. But if you're asking for a transaction, quote, without the participation or approval of the RIRs, then, quite frankly, where's the registry in which that transaction happened? And if there is none, 
then what stops me selling you an address today, you the same address tomorrow, you the same address the day after? Because if there's no registry to register that transaction, how do you know who actually owns which address? Where is uniqueness if you haven't got a registry function? So like the land titles office in real estate, you know, the underlying function of tracking the association of party to address is super critical for the internet, no matter what. And if what you're really saying is the overlay on some policies around admittance to the registry and the new practices around transfers and markets are coming into some critical tensions, fine. That's a great way of phrasing it because basically we need to sort that through as an industry, as an entire industry. So you, what we oh, would hold look on, at Just it. let me correct myself. So I did say the without the participation and approval, and I shouldn't have said participation. Obviously, the participation. registry would have to update, and uh, that was an overstatement, and thank you for nailing me on that. I, he saved me. I was... I don't think anyone here is saying that there should not be participation. What we don't want is the policies to drive people away from participating. And I hope, Jeff, you would agree that our concern is, is that we would like alignment of incentives and policies to meet so that people aren't incentivized to avoid participation. And, you know, that very much is at the heart of what this whole debate is about. Because once you move from abundance to scarcity, a lot of the issues around the registry function and the consequent movement of addresses to address the worst effects of scarcity come into stark focus. And yes, the legacy RSA issue, exactly what are the rights of the registry in terms of policy making versus the rights of the address holder who had the address since 1970 something or other, do come into the debate, yes. Okay, we have some comments from the online participants. Uh, it's a comment from John Curran. It said that it's, impo it's important to remember that the regional internet registers and the uh, IANA form a single registry no known as the uh, internet register system. Uh, this was clearly established by those who developed the internet protocol system and documented in REFC uh, 1174. It was his comment. that the only comment? Okay. Uh, I don't sense a lot of discussion here. Is there anybody else that wants to intervene in this? If not, we'll move on to a straw poll. Paul? Uh, Paul Dixie, Aaron Board of Trustees. Um, as John said, the uh, protocol that uses these 32-bit numbers and the original pool that we are still using was all established by the same body using a document series called the RFC series. Uh, and the Internet RIR system was created by that same RFC series. Uh, we appear to be living in a consensus world where uniqueness is currently guaranteed. Um, I believe that the legacy holders are in their respective regions are uh, going to have to go get services from the RIRs in those regions because uh, that's the world we live in. Avri Doria. By the way, I apologize. Uh, this is the room that should have had microphones all over the place, and uh, we only have a few. Um Thank you. I think the question I've got or what's confusing me is if this set are not subject to RIR regarding registration, but RIR policies can go way beyond just the fact that you've got to have the, 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 the number registered with the name and the who it is. The, 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 the policies are so much bigger. So while I could answer positively that, of course, they need to be registered according to RIR policies, but anything more than that is another question. So this, this either or here with this very open RIR policy makes it difficult to answer. Um, very quickly in response to that without necessarily addressing it, um, IPv4 has exposed the duality of the RIR function in a way that's never been obvious before. Up until exhaustion, we were the folk that gave out addresses 
and then recorded what we gave out. And you could argue that we were an allocator, a distributor. We weren't necessarily a registry maintainer, and the registry was a side effect of having given it out. But we've given it all out. There's nothing left back in the bank. And we are a registry in name. We are the titles office now. And that the policies we made about allocation, about how we give it out, who we give it out to, etc., etc., you kind of have to wonder if all of them apply strictly to the policies that would apply were you only running a registry and no other function, which is really realistically where V4 is. So it's a good question and a certain amount of soul seeking as to what is in a registry versus what is in an allocation plus registry. And I know that there have been a number of discussion documents put forward at the RIPE NCC meetings on this very topic of looking at what is the registry function as we move forward with IPv4. And I'd certainly commend them to you for reading because it's, it's interesting reading in terms of the changing role if registration is all you're on about and the integrity of the address plant of the internet is your absolute goal, that addresses need to be completely unambiguous in the way in which they are used. If we don't get that, we don't have a net. I'm going to, uh, I've just noticed that really, um, first of all, I agree with Avri that these questions are badly formulated. Um, and uh, the actual question we probably want to be asking here is number C, the accuracy of post-transaction records. So what we have there are two options. Let's hypothetically say that two legacy holders or, or a two parties, uh, one of them a legacy holder, sells an address block to uh, somebody else and doesn't go through any RIR approval process. C1, the policy position, is that RIRs should update these legacy transactions based on legal proof of transfer. And C2 says that RIRs should not update records unless the receiving party signs a contract and conforms to all the associated RIR policies. So actually, that's the real question that we're ask, asking here, and we don't need B at all. We can just cross that out and move on. So would we like to take up the debate based on that? Um, again, I, I should note here that the world isn't as simple as you'd like. Um, the RIRs are not charities. There are very real costs in running a registry, extraordinary costs in some ways, but you know, uniqueness has a price and that to maintain an accurate record of alive people, not dead people, who currently have address holdings, their current address, their current you know, location and so on, takes money. And the whole issue around why the RIRs are, in effect, use membership and service and fee structures is all about funding the registry. So to have folk who have access into the registry with transactions by some legal right without paying their fair share of the registry costs seems to be a might unfair to everyone else who is. And that typically it would be good to understand that everyone who is serviced by a registry pays some proportion of the costs of running that registry, irrespective of their history. Now, that's the overall philosophy of a lot of the RIR work, of making sure that the RIR is a communal asset operated and funded by the community it serves. The legacy work came in as a precondition and that for a long time they sat slightly to one side. Many folk did join the registry and you know become participants, others didn't. Your phrasing of this suggests that the RIR should continue to operate a charity byproduct. That if you weren't currently serviced, you know, paying your fees in the registry but had an entry, you could continue to trade. I'm actually not sure that everyone wants that. That I think most folk would actually go, look, if I can pay my share, I'm quite happy to pay my share. And if the real an argument is an argument about the policies of the registry that don't seem to suit every individual occasion, then, you know, there are certainly ways to redress this inside the RIR policy forums and even inside workshops like this, but it gets down to quite a specific area. What is the problem that we need to address to be more encompassing of a broad range of circumstances where we assume at the bottom that everyone has common goodwill, that everyone is willing to pay their fair share of maintaining a registry. 
So it's not that registry should update the registry irrespective and we should operate a charity service if they refuse to be a member and refuse to pay. That's, I don't think, the real issue here. All right. No, I, I agree that it's not. I think um, it's more of a vertical integration issue uh, from an economist or a policy analyst standpoint is that they are running a registry. I think uh, nobody would mind, uh, none of the legacy holders would mind paying them a uh, monthly fee to maintain that registry. I don't think that's what we're debating. The issue is that the value of the registry is then tied to a host of other policies and requirements and obligations which are then imposed on them by virtue of their control of the registry records. I think that's, that's what the issue is. And again, uh, this may not be perfectly formulated, but that's, we can change it. For example, we could change C1 to say the, the R, RI should update legacy transactions based on legal proof of transfer, but transactors should pay some share of registry costs. Uh, yeah, that's essentially what, what I was going to say is there's a club, you're a member, you get all kinds of privileges without paying. If you don't want to join the club, you pay a fee for the transactions that, that you ask for. And it, it, it's, it's not a hard model. I mean, yes, it's better to be a member of the club and you want everybody to join your club. But if you just are saying, no, we don't agree to the club, but we agree to the fact of, of keeping a good registry and we pay for every time you, we ask you to do work in, in keeping with being a good registry. Are there any online comments? Let's hear it. Uh, there are two comments from uh, John Caron. Uh, first of all, he said that I would like to follow on Mr. Job's comment that the word is not as simple as Mr. Mueller describes. In particular, the options on question C presume uh, that a legal transfer can actually occur independent of the I, uh, R IARC system, which may not be true, and he has also responds to the uh, Mr. Averill's comment that uh, some of the policies, such as minimum log size, are due to implications on the internet routing system, and while that's more than just register accuracy, it is still very important to keeping the internet operational. That's it. Any other comments on this issue? Well, again, again, this one is very fundamental. Um, the issue has to do with the proper role of the, the registry. Is it's, uh, Do you use the leverage of this extremely valuable uniqueness uh, function to impose vertically related policies and requirements on the holders, even when they have no contract, uh, or, do you, or do you not do that? Do you refrain from doing that? You don't like that form. Again, I, I don't like that formulation. This idea that it's an external imposition, as I went back and said a long time ago, in a deregulated model, this is an industry self-regulatory body. This is us. This is the rules that we actually imposed upon ourselves. This is not an arbitrary bunch of people sitting in some dark room in the back corners creating impositions for the rest of the industry. And the remedy, as always, is if you think that the current frameworks around the registry don't meet the panoply of needs today, talk about it. Talk to your friends, talk to your industry associates, talk about it and argue your case. Because quite frankly, the real issue about C is, should we have an accurate registry or not? Yeah. Well, an inaccurate registry is rubbish. It's not worth, you know, it's not worth doing. We all need an accurate registry because ambiguity in address space is intolerable. So the next question is, what are the pressures that we've currently got around maintaining the accuracy of registry? And how do we, as a community, as an industry, address those pressures constructively? You know, and part of it is, yes, there's a strong legacy. We need to understand that. B, there are changing circumstances, and we need to understand those too. We're now meeting where the rubber hits the road in scarcity of third-party brokers. Other folk with interest coming in saying, well, actually, we need a little bit of latitude here. We need some stretch space over here. We need different things. That's quite legitimate if your goal is to make sure that industry needs are fairly addressed by all as a self-regulatory structure. Let's go there. But if your real question is, should RIR policies trump registry accuracy? Well, I would say by definition, no. Registry accuracy is important. 
And if the issue is that our policies don't quite match the panoply of needs of industry today, let's talk about it. But the whole reason why we hold so many policy meetings, and we hold a lot, is actually because registries are not set in concrete. They're not some immutable thing. They change and react to changing circumstances. And the industry needs to understand that change is part and parcel of what we're going through. We ran out. How much bigger change do you want? Yeah, I, again, I think there is no real debate about whether the registry should be accurate. I think what we have is a debate over who pays the price of that accuracy. Does the legacy holder have to subject themselves contractually to uh, the current policies? Uh, or does the registry have to back off from those policies when they're dealing with legacy holders? And this choice is very stark because there are, again, billions of dollars at stake. And so the fear is that uh, if the registry doesn't back down and people start doing uh, deals outside of the registry, as you said earlier, we might get competing registries. So I think it's a question of the balance of how much should the RIRs uh, accommodate these legacy holders by um, recognizing that they don't have contractual authority over them. Uh, you know, talk all about uh, industry self-regulation and so on and so forth, but industry self-regulation has to occur through contractual agreement. There's no other basis for it. And uh, if there's no contractual agreement, it's not clear that's the nicest way to put it. It's simply unclear what rights these two parties have with respect to each other and what is the best way to go forward. So I think that's what we need to be talking about is who, you know, how do we make this uh, trade-off between these two vested interests. Uh, this is Paul Vixie, Aaron Board of Trustees. Um, the legacy holders in all five regions are able to get all of the services that uh, non-legacy holders get. Uh, sometimes they have to sign a contract, sometimes not. Uh, but there's, uh, they're, they're not at any special disadvantage as, as a result of being a legacy holder now. So um, given that as we have run out of IPv4, uh, the need for a efficient utilization has increased rather than decreased, I'm not sure why we would need to create an alternative policy regime. Um, you, you, you really have not made your, your fundamental point here. Paul, this is Peter. Um, it, no, it doesn't cover all the, the services. It covers most. Uh, it does not cover transfer services. And also, you, you touch on a key point. Uh, the, companies, the companies would like to also have a choice and determine if just your services are the only services they want, or are they allowed to choose and actually get other services? So in the end of the day, a company that has been acquired several times wishes to update its number block. It is not permitted to update that number block in the new acquiring company's name without agreeing to some type of contract. Okay, uh, Vixie again. Um, legacy holders are perfectly capable of participating in the transfer process in the Aaron region. So your information about that is simply incorrect. As to the specific problem of uh, a, a multiple acquisitions where the records are simply out of date, uh, that is a paperwork problem. And uh, I, I myself have dealt with it in the past by showing the entire paper trail of all the various acquisitions in order to get the records up to date at which point you have complete fluidity with regard to current process. But, but you still, the key point is you have to sign a contract to get that done. You said that legacy holders have availability to all services. Our point is the only way they get all those services is buying a green to a contract with Aaron. Our point is that the, the registry then is being used is leverage against them from participating in an accurate registry. So that is an unusual twist to say that the you would rather promulgate an inaccurate registry because a company, and we represent many of them, say they do not wish to sign an agreement with Aaron to update the registry. So, I, and this goes back to a conversation that, that I watched Jeff have with John Curran uh, at Nanog uh, about a year ago where the question is, is the registry's function to maintain accurate data or to use policies to enforce that they become normalized in their system? 
and that's the question. And and I'm not I'm not casting dispersions. I, I understand the use. Our component is that we really believe in accurate post transaction records because that's the question here. And the only way for a post transaction record for a legacy holder to get that done is to enter into an agreement. That service is not provided, but it is provided to already RSA or LRSA signed blocks. So, um, Dixie again. Peter, if you're proposing that um, an RER or any uh, organization should take action uh, that without a contract, uh, that's, that's off topic. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's try to uh, uh, get a straw poll going here. I think, um, again, we're in no danger of uh, finding agreement. Uh, no but, danger of finding agreement. But um, I, I, I want to make one more substantive point about what the issues really are. I, again, I think it's a fairly neutral point, and that is uh, neither side can claim um, – innocence and purity here in the sense that the legacy holders are in some sense benefiting from the maintenance of a registry by the RIR. And the, um, there's no way for the RIRs to avoid the fact that their, their contracts which enforce their policies are simply not applicable to legacy holders. So uh, there is no way that either side uh, is going to get exactly what they want here. Something is going, going to have to give. Now, our our two policy options. Uh, I've just mod modified C1 in connection with comments from the floor with, uh, and from Jeff, actually. So C1 should now read, uh, RIRs should update legacy transactions based on legal proof of transfers and should pay a fair share of registry costs. A C2 would be that RIRs should not update records unless receiving party signs a contract and conforms to RIR policies. I think that's a pretty accurate reflection of the dichotomous choice that we face. And I, I suspect we'll have to find something in the middle, but I'm interested in finding out as a straw poll where people stand in that dichotomous choice at this moment. So our, our remote participation uh, uh, operators, uh, are they ready to expr express these choices? Uh, let's call it C1 and C2. C1 again is RIR should update the transactions based on legal proof of transfer and, and they should also pay, the legacy owner should pay a fair share of registry costs. C2 is that RIR should not update their records unless the receiving party signs a contract and conforms to RIR policies. So, straw poll, let's uh, go for C1. Raise your hand if you're for C1. Five. Do we have uh, any, okay, hold on a sec. Uh, C2, again, RIR should not update those records unless the receiving party signs a contract and conforms to the RIR policies expressed in that contract. And I voted. Two. Two. Thank you. I will, definitely. Um, we are also supposed to add none of the above. <laughs> Avery cannot vote for that now because she voted for one of the options. Uh, okay. And uh, are there any abstentions? I think there should be a lot of abstentions. A lot of people are not. Yes. We have uh, Jeff. One, two, three. Any other abstentions? And then there's just the non-voting, I guess. Um, now, Milton, we're now at the end of time. Yeah, we are. Um, we got to get the online. Did the online people express uh, their opinions? Uh, there was a comment and question. Uh, the comment is fr uh, from Alexei Ivanov. He said that we are a large uh, LIR in RIPE region and we operate five years, and I can tell that needs assessment works not very good. 
uh, our IR cannot go to company and check them so needs assessment uh, equal how good story has end user it's better use some restriction for transfers uh, to your period when company can transfer uh, IPs it will be more effective and there is one question for, from John Curran again he said that it's a uh, question to Mr. Milton he said that in answer to question C are we to presume that the RIRs are allowed to violate global policy uh, ICA and an ICP2 or not. Thank you. Uh, my answer to John is uh, I don't know whether we're assuming that or not. I'm just interested in the straw poll on the two questions that we were put forward. Um, I, I don't think it's uh, necessarily relevant. If he thinks that uh, ICP2 means uh, that one of those two options is uh, he can't support, then uh, he should uh, vote accordingly. Um, we've now used up all of our available time and a bit more. It's now 17 minutes past four and the next session does start again at 4.30, so we've got no more time. Um, I think it does stress the comment that I made earlier that this whole issue of V4 exhaustion has posed a completely new set of issues uh, around the current registry system in addresses. And the old ideas around allocation and registration now have to admit some new ideas about coping with exhaustion. And I think this is a small window on what, for the regional internet registry community, has been a very, very long and continuing debate about what is the right way to get the internet through. How long do we need to do these measures? What measures in particular are required? and what will actually encourage in the long run a move towards V6 through all of this. So uh, thank you for your time from me and it's certainly been hopefully uh, interesting for you. And thank you from me as well. Again, I, I think it was uh, a little more demanding but uh, much more interesting and productive to try to structure the deliberation in this way and to make people commit themselves in a straw poll. Uh, and, uh, I look forward to seeing you in the main session on critical internet resources tomorrow morning.